God has an answer for every problem we have in our hearts. Solutions for our spiritual problems must be sought for the scriptural way by using God's word. The word of God discerns the real motives and intentions of our heart as it states in Hebrews 4 verse 12. The word of God is a light that searches and discovers all the hidden needs of our heart and then offers us the true remedy. Let's read Psalm 119 verse 130. The entrance of your words gives light. He gives understanding to the simple. Psalm 119, verse 130. Our real problems are not really discovered by human analysis. Man's methods deal more with the soul, but we need to go directly to the root of the problems, straight to the issues of our heart. So today I want to analyze the subject of envy and jealousy. And first of all, it's a common problem of the human heart and even long before man was created. So I want to offer 10 solutions for these uh, problems of envy and jealousy. Well, first of all, let's start by defining envy and then defining jealousy. And then we want to give illustrations in the Bible to gain victory in our lives. Well, let's define envy. It means to dislike, to oppose, to have bad feelings against someone because they have some advantage or something superior. Well, a great example of this is found in Genesis 26, verse 12, to 16. Isaac's neighbors, the Philistines, envied him because he was blessed of God, and they urged him to leave by stopping up his wells. So envy stops up wells, and <clears throat> this is a major reason for revival wells being stopped up sometimes, and the moving of God's Spirit. Well, let's look at Genesis 30 and verse 1. Rachel envied her sister because Leah had children, but she was barren. Envy. Well, they have something better than I do, and I don't like them. Joseph's brothers, remember, in chapter 37, verse 5 of Genesis. Joseph's brothers hated him because the father made him the heir. And that's quoted also in Acts 7, verse 9. Do you know why Jesus was crucified? It was because of envy. Envy blinded the theologians of the Lord's day. They were not able to recognize the Messiah and understand his teachings. They realized that his authority was far superior to theirs. And it says in Matthew 7, 28 and 29, for he taught them as one having authority and not like the scribes. So they envied him, and when they brought him to Pontius Pilate to crucify him, even Pilate understood that it was envy that was driving these chief priests to deliver Jesus to be crucified. Just read Matthew 27, 18 and Mark 15, verse 10. So it was envy that nailed Jesus to the cross. And envy is one of the works of the flesh mentioned in Galatians 5, 21. Do you know that carried to an extreme, envy could destroy a person's soul? Well, we're gonna talk now about jealousy. And they're similar, but they're different. Jealousy can be summed up as the need, the demand to be number one. It opposes all rivals. Remember when King David 
became competition to King Saul. The king wanted to kill him. King Saul wanted to kill David. We are told in Song of Solomon 8 verse 6 that jealousy is as cruel as the grave. A murderous spirit. Well, let's talk about the right kind of jealousy that only belongs to God. In Exodus 34 verse 14, God's very title is Jealous. He's a jealous God. You shall worship no other gods, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. But he alone deserves the demand to be number one because he owns the whole universe. But when man tries to exalt himself and draw men to him and glorify him, it, he's cursed with a perverse spirit of jealousy. Well, although envy and jealousy have separate meanings, they have several things in common. Both revolve around the sin of comparing and competing with others. And this is the result of an uncrucified ego. Envy and jealousy originated long before man was created. It started in heaven, and it started when Lucifer compared himself with the one who sat on the throne, and he coveted his position. He wanted, Lucifer wanted to be the center of attention and have all worship directed toward him. So, envy and jealousy are two evils that have motivated Satan ever since that time. That's the spirit of this world, too. Well, in the near future, Satan is going to produce an imposter to the world and indwell a man who magnifies himself above every god. That's what it says in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3 and 4. The, the beast the Antichrist, is going to show great animosity toward anyone who does not worship him and hail him as number one. Envy, jealousy. We see jealousy portrayed in the book of Esther by a man named Haman who wanted to exterminate the whole Jewish race because one man, Mordecai, did not bow to him and acknowledge him. We read this in Esther chapter 3 verse 5 and 6. Can you imagine wanting to wipe out a whole race of people because one man didn't bow to you? The jealousy of Satan. Well, when mankind fell in the Garden of Eden, the evils of envy and jealousy became the instruments that brought about the first murder in the first family. Remember Abel, his life uh, and offerings were very acceptable and pleasing to God, but Cain's were not. So comparing himself with his younger brother, who was more righteous than him, Cain hated him and murdered him. And this is brought out in 1 John 3, verse 11 and 12. He was of that wicked one, of the same nature. So this slaying of the, of the righteous by the wicked is going to be reenacted many times in our day when the Antichrist is here. The true Christians will be hated by the followers of the false Christ and the false prophet. We read this in Matthew 24, verse 9, and in Revelation 6, verse 9 through 11. It's interesting, the righteous never attack the wicked. It's always the wicked who attack the righteous. And what is the motivation behind it? It's envy and jealousy. The word jealousy is called emulations in the King James Version in Galatians 5.20. It's also one of the works of the flesh 
And it can destroy a person's soul if it is not brought under subjection and carried to an extreme. I've always remembered this story uh, in Africa where there were 12 missionaries who prayed fervently for revival in their region. And suddenly God moved and answered their prayers. And there were a thousand people gathered around their little place there. And, the, and God began to move by his spirit and do miracles. But there is something sad about this when it happened. Two of the ladies who prayed the most fervently for revival were the first to oppose it. Why? Envy, jealousy. Maybe God was using people they didn't like or consider worthy. Whatever problems they had in their lives, we can see how these unresolved motives in their hearts distorted, opposed what God was endeavoring to do. Acts 28 verse 30 is interesting. You remember when this snake came out of the fire and, and latched down to Paul? So, spiritually, when God's fire is moving, it causes vipers, like envy and jealousy, to come forth, to be revealed. So, friends, before revival fire comes, let's ask God to deal privately with these snakes that could be in our lives. Uh, let's consider now some keys for having these maladies dealt with in our lives. I'd like to offer 10 cures for envy and jealousy. These are major problems of the human nature. All right, number one is a pure heart, pure motives. Our whole objective is to bring glory to God alone and for us to stay hidden behind the cross. You know, when we have pure motives, we'll never be tormented with envy or jealousy or if our heart is pure. But many people seek their own glory and a great name. And listen to what Paul said in Philippians 1 verse 15. He said, some ministers indeed preach Christ even out of envy and rivalry. That's Philippians 1 15. So the, the question is, are we building our kingdom or God's kingdom? Are we seeking to have a great name for ourselves, Or are we trying to glorify God's name? Are we driven with ambition? Or are we striving to make God number one and to glorify him? So we want to have a pure heart. All right, number two to cure envy and jealousy is that we should not compare ourselves with others. So, when people boast that their church is the fastest growing church in the region, oh, they're comparing. And this is what Paul tells us in the scripture. He says that by measuring and comparing ourselves with each other, we are not wise. Did you hear? That's the answer. For this problem. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 12. The word of God forbids us to do this. Comparing ourselves with one another and measuring ourselves with each other, we are not wise. So we are told not to do that. Another example of this is when John, uh, Peter and John were together and Peter looked at John one day and said, Lord, what will this man do? In John 21, verse 20 and 21, the Lord said to him, it's not important for you to know what your brother is doing. Just follow me. Never mind what others are doing. So this is the Lord's counsel to us too. Just keep your eyes on me, not on what your brother is doing. Don't compare or measure yourself with anyone else. That was the word of the Lord to Peter. Don't compare yourself with John or anyone else. Just follow me. Number three, another cure for envy and jealousy. No competing. 
So even the 12 apostles of the Lamb were not exempt from the spirit of competition. Do you remember on the last day of the Lord's life around the communion table, they were arguing who is going to be counted the greatest? Read Luke 22, verse 19 to 26. Well, what did it take to break the spirit of competition in these early apostles? They needed a death blow of failure. Remember, they all forsook Jesus in the garden. They later saw their Lord brutally beaten and slain. But you know, a few weeks later, on the day of Pentecost, they were all in one accord in the upper room. Acts 2 verse 1, their competition was broken. So we must not compare or compete. <clears throat> you see, that was even a major problem with the 12 foundation stones of the church, the 12 apostles. Well, number four, we should not care who gets the credit. And I love the saying of our former president, Ronald Reagan, he said, there is no limit to what a man can accomplish if he doesn't care who gets the credit. So if we're only seeking to draw attention to God and not ourselves, why should we care who gets the credit? Because the Lord who sees in secret is going to reward us openly. So Matthew 6, verse 6, the Lord who sees in secret shall reward you openly. So, do we really believe this, or does our faith need more purifying, according to 1 Peter 1, verse 7? Are we seeking to bring glory to God or to ourselves? In John 12, 43, they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. We must not be that way. Number five. We need to esteem others better than ourselves. Wow, that's the exact opposite of the fallen nature. This is putting aside our own ego, putting on the garments of humility and brotherly kindness. This is what Paul exhorts in scripture. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in humility of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Philippians 2 verse 3 and 4. And then he tells us in Romans 12, verse 10, in honor, preferring one another before me. Wow, that is so opposite of the human fallen nature. You know, friends, the key to unity is humility. This is the key to conquering envy and jealousy, to honor others, esteem others better than ourselves. And it's the secret to overcoming the spirit of competition and all envy and jealousy. Humility, the key to unity. Lord, help us. Jesus said, I am meek and humble. Learn this from me and you'll find rest in your soul. Number six, another cure for envy and jealousy is to have your own personal promises from God. That makes you secure. If you see others getting ahead of you, so what? I have my own promises. It gives you inner strength. It makes you secure. And you don't look at others or measure yourself with them. Well, let's look at several people in the Bible. Let's look at Abraham. He had promises from God. This land is yours, Abraham, to you and your seed. And so he never felt threatened by anyone else. And he never worried about people confiscating anything from him because he had promises from God. So when we read Genesis 13, verse 5 through 9, there was a strife over the land. And what did Abraham do? He gave Lot, his nephew, first choice. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Because he knew ultimately that that land was going to be his and his seed. 
Amen. So friends, we need to ask God for personal promises. Promises even that go beyond this life into eternity. When you have promises, you will win the victory over envy and jealousy. And you will be very secure. Many people are insecure. But when you have promises, it makes you secure. All right, another cure, number seven, is to understand that when God accepts others, he's not rejecting you. And a good example of this we find in the book of Acts. The Jews believed that they were God's chosen people above all. And therefore, when God started accepting the Gentiles and made them fellow heirs of the same promises, they were moved with jealousy. They didn't want to share their position of being number one with anyone. But listen, it was a privilege to share what God had given them to give to others. So what did they do? They contradicted and blasphemed Paul's message. Just read Acts 13, verse 42 to 45. You know, the Jews should have accepted the gospel with joy and rejoiced that it was being shared with all the nations of the world. God's acceptance of the Gentiles was not a rejection of them. No. It was actually to their honor that the good news would come to them first and that they were going to share with all the nations of the world, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. So when God is blessing others, it doesn't mean that he is ignoring us. We should thank the Lord. Number eight, we need to appreciate other members of the body of Christ. Paul likens the body of Christ to a human body. And every organ, every part of the body has a different function, but it's vital to the well-being of the whole body. We are only a part of the body of Christ, and but we are interdependent upon each other for survival. So we need to appreciate all the other members of the body rather than compete with them. Well, sometimes people struggle with self-rejection because they think their function is less important than others. So the Apostle Paul is going to deal with this attitude in the writings to the Corinthians. So would you like to look at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 15 and 16? And this is what he says to them. The foot cannot say, because I'm not as important as the hand, therefore I'm no good at all. Or the ear cannot say, because I'm not as important as the eye, I'm not important at all. No, this is insecurity, self-rejection. It's comparing and competing. We need each other. You know, in the natural, some parts of the body are covered and some are seen. But this doesn't mean that the parts that are covered are not important. On a piano board, there are many keys, and some are sounded more than others, but that doesn't mean that the ones that are sounded less are not important. Of course they are. What would a piece of music sound like if certain keys were missing? Every part is important. We're all different. Number nine, we need to realize that we're all in different spiritual seasons in our life. This is another reason we cannot measure or compare ourselves with others. Do you know that in the book of Acts, the Apostle John, his name is only mentioned two times in two accounts in the book of Acts, in chapter 3 and in chapter 8. And that's that he was alongside of Peter. But <clears throat> Peter stands out as the dominant figure in much of the book of Acts. But listen, Peter blossomed earlier in life, and John came forth later in life. Do you know... John emerged to the forefront 30 years after Peter died. 
when he wrote the book of Revelation in 96 AD and the Gospel of John. Peter had died 30 years before, but John was blossoming later in life. We're all different. We cannot measure or compare ourselves. We're all in different seasons. Every one of us is totally unique. There's only one person like you or me. There's no one else in the world exactly like us. And God has his own specific plan for our lives. So it's actually foolish to compare or measure ourselves with someone else. So friends, let's remember that illustration with Peter and John. Peter came forth earlier in life and John came forth later in life. Every one of us is totally different. God's timetable and plan for you will differ from others. And number 10, have the love of God perfected in you. When we read 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 through 6, it tells us that love does not envy. Love does not seek her own interests. Love is not self-seeking, which is the root of jealousy. So envy and jealousy are the exact opposite of divine love, divine nature. God's love is totally unselfish, but envy and jealousy are self-seeking, self-grasping. Remember the young, immature Corinthians envied each other, and the immature Galatians devoured one another with envy. But Paul calls them both little children spiritually. They were immature. So let's grow into spiritual manhood. And that's reflected by an unselfish divine nature, brotherly love and unity. Here is where the Lord commands the blessing, even life forevermore. Read Psalm 133. Unity is the result of humility, esteeming others better than ourselves rather than promoting ourselves. Well, so I want to encourage us to remember these 10 points. The Spirit of God knows exactly what our needs are and he can reveal them to us through the sacred scriptures. Often psychology and human analysis doesn't reach the real needs in our life. So remember, the Word of God discerns the, the thoughts and motives of our heart. Remember Hebrews 4, verse 12. Okay, God bless you. We'll see you next week.